How many of you are space weenies? <laughs> space nerds? How many of you saw The Martian? <laughs> Bit of a complicated situation, eh? Well, what I'm going to show you uh, may make that a lot more safe and simple, sort of building on Shiv and Joban's presentation. This is sort of a version of that taken from the ground to the sky, but to potentially to uh, open the solar system. And I'm with UCSC, so I'm truly a local slug here in Slug Vale. So this was the vision of space in 1952. The Collier's Magazine articles that, John, that Werner von Braun was involved with, with the rotating space colony for 200. And this was their idea for getting to Mars. <coughs> And it's interesting, I studied this, I was like, look at all those tanker ships, you know, oh, this is how we're going to get to Mars. This is way before Sputnik, but this is the vision of space. Pretty cool, huh? Hmm. Do any of you remember this? Yeah. Hmm. Remember this? When I saw this, when I was a kid, I thought, they did not get those trusses in that little shuttle. How did they build this thing, you know? And my little mathematical brain was saying, well, there's like, 200,000 launches to build this thing. What is going on? <laughs> Stanley Kubrick's uh, space station. So turns out that yes, um, it's hard to build stuff in space when you're lifting it from the ground. And this is what we built in 2011 with a gazillion billion dollars and a shuttle program over 30 years. This is what we were able to build for six people. Tops, <laughs> tops. <laughs> So why am I involved in this? Well, I was a space weenie in the 70s. This is me doing a talk in our town in 1980. You know, were you, how many of you were alive in 1980? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I was doing my asteroid miner designs and everything in the paper, and I was sending my designs off to NASA and institutes. So getting letters back, you know, thank you very much kind of letters. Uh, but 25 years later, this is me at NASA. And I did over 25 design and simulation projects for them. And the biggest one was this one in 2007, this is my scribbles, how to take humans to an asteroid. The first design, not Bruce Willis style, but the first design of how to really take a crew out to an asteroid and dock the spacecraft, basically tying it down. So I still was pondering, why the heck haven't we done more? You know, in 50 years in space. Why haven't we? And then one night, I was looking up, and there was a meteor shower coming in. This was about 10, 15 years ago. And my, I was with my friend Brad Blair, and he's a total lunar mining guy. He's going to go and mine the moon and stuff like that. And I I'm always like doubted that that was even possible, because I come from a mining family. And, oh, I lost the slides. So my brother drives a 300-ton drives a haul truck in a mine in Canada. And every time I would show him space miner designs, like excavators and stuff like that, he would just laugh. And he would say, where's the mountain of spare parts? Where's, where's the building with the guy eating pizza and another guy sitting on his butt and another guy fixing the broken uh, teleoperated mining equipment? So I was with Brad Blair, and there was this meteor shower. And I said, Brad, what if instead of it just being a comet tail debris, what if it was a comet that got caught in the Earth-Moon system and got trapped? And it was orbiting the Earth, and it was blowing off its tail. And he turned to me and he said, that would be the most valuable real estate in the solar system. There would be tens of thousands of tons of water ice on that thing, and carbon dioxide, and methane, and every space-faring nation would try to state a, a claim, a prospector's claim, and getting that thing because it would open the door to space. And I said, well, why don't we go and learn how to get those things? It's a no-brainer, you know. <laughs> so years later, I finally started working on this, and this is the design that emerged. It's called Shepard, and you'll see a little bit more about it later. But it's basically how do you extend a bag, a balloon structure around the asteroid, tight seal it, and then introduce gas uh, to manage it. And you'll see a little bit more about this later. This is some of the designs. But this was kind of just a thought in my head until one day I met this man, Peter Janiskins, who's one of the world's great meteor astronomers. If there's a flash in the sky and something hits the ground, his phone rings. 
This is, this is what he does. And we went out for a bowl of clam chowder, and, and because I showed him my designs on my cell phone. He said, oh, I'll never work. You know, world's greatest meteor astronomer says idea is, is, is bollocks. And um, then we had the bowl of clam chowder, and then we were finished, and he said, I figured out how to make it work. <laughs> and this is how it works. We introduce gas into the enclosure. We never touch the asteroid. They're very fragile. They're rubble piles, something weighing a thousand tons. If a piece comes off, it destroys your spacecraft. Hmm. And so uh, we use xenon gas as an initial management uh, uh, ability. And then he, he rang up this man, Julian Knott, the world's greatest living Phineas Fogg balloon designer. And in a five-week period, you know, Phineas or Julian and I designed how to extend the balloon structure around the asteroid. You know, from a helium balloon designer, he designs the balloons people jump out of at a quarter million feet. But without further ado, let's show you how this would work. This is Shepard, the craziest new spacecraft of the 21st century. And here we are coming up to our asteroid. We're, we're scanning it with the LIDAR to make sure we, we know what its shape is. We're moving our enclosure to center. Now we're pushing our air beams, pushing them down to closure, to the seal enclosure that Julian and I designed. And then we introduce our xenon gas. And these things are ro rotating usually at about one RPM. But if we can introduce a tenth of an atmosphere of xenon, we can slow it. Within 24 hours, we can stop the rotation of one of these asteroids. And then, like a sailing ship, we project waves of gas, of very gentle waves, at the presenting end to this thing, and it'll rotate, and we can actually move these things in the solar system. It's a sailing ship in space. <laughs> so, what, what goal, what, what nuggets are we going to go after in the solar system? Well. Uh, this is the comet that was visited by the Europeans, by the Rosetta uh, spacecraft. Uh, that's full of water ice. Here's something else. This is a nickel iron asteroid. It's, a lot of the nickel in, in your cell phone cases and things like that comes from asteroids pummeling into the Earth and the big mines are around where these nickel iron asteroids came in. So what do you do is you go out far enough in the solar system where there's a lot of captured ice inside these asteroids. They're called icy planetesimals for the space weenies. And you start to heat up the enclosure until the gases come off. You can see them sort of spraying off in this concept. And we're pulling them through our air beams, concentrating uh, the material through cold plates and basically uh, getting water ice down to water. And then we start using our solar electric collection system to break it, to, elect, uh, to electrolyze it to uh, hydrogen and oxygen, so we've got a propulsion source, a fuel source. So here's a really crazy idea that occurred to us a year ago, which is we can use a process invented by a guy in the 19th century called the Mond process. It's a manufacturing process where he put a, a block of nickel into a chamber, put carbon monoxide gas in an electric field, and it pulled the nickel along the field out of the, of the gas, and he could plate. He could make precision 3D parts. It was one of the first sort of additive manufacturing techniques. We could do this on a gigantic scale with something, you know, 10,000 tons, and we could make large parts, precision parts on what's called the mandrel there deposited. So hence the Kubrick Space Station. And the last, this is my favorite. This is what came to me one late one night. It was like, how do we feed people in space? And if any of you have in your homes those glass globes mm -hmm. that have like fish in them or shrimp and they have, and, and all they need is sunlight, they're sealed. Well, why not do that in space? Why not melt down an icy planetesimal? All the rocky parts will go into the center, you have a, a different atmosphere around it, and you have a glo globule, and you just introduce biology, and you can harvest from it, farming in space. All three elements you need to build a space-faring civilization. So here's how it would work. If we wanted to go to Mars, for example, we would uh, go to the, the uh, basically the snow line, get ourselves icy, icy planetesimal, move it potentially to the orbit of Mars. This is a multi-year process. And then we launch from Earth. We launch the, the mission from Earth because we have our return fuel already. And once we get to Mars, we, we, we get our mission, we have a, basically a canister 
filled up with uh, basically the earthbound fuel and water and consumables that we brought from another Shepard craft is empty. So we pop that one off, we take the, the fresh one, put it on the Mars craft, we're ready to go back to Earth at a moment's notice. And we can then send this canister back to be refilled. So it's, you know, it's basically like gas stations in space. And because there's so much fuel, there's so many resources available, you can go all over Mars, not just the one place where Matt Damon was stuck in a terrible place, right? You could land all over Mars. Much, much, much safer and better way to go to Mars, to explore other planets, just because you, you live in the clean environment of space and you explore the planet that way. So, and these space stations, we can actually build them. We can build the big trusses and the beams and the big, big heavy parts that will be needed to build something beyond the current little tin can space station we have. And we can potentially feed, <laughs> feed people in space, just using the stuff we're made out of. These asteroids are what were the building blocks of life anyway. <laughs> so it's a much better way to sustainably go into space. So here's me in 1980, and here's uh, Von Braun's vision asking if we can get to Mars, and I would say, we can go to Mars. <laughs> now, because you're entrepreneurs, I have to do my business pitch, or who am I going to pitch this business to? Well, turns out one of our team members' great, uh, grandfather worked for this man, Julian Knott, the, our English uh, team member, our balloon designer. His grandfather worked for this man whose name is Isambard Kingdom Brunel. This guy, in the 1830s, took the steam engine that was invented by Newcomen a hundred years before, and he turned it into a transportation revolution, single-handedly. And he's standing by the anchor chain of the Great Eastern, the first huge steamship. So he put them in steamships. And then, look at this guy's face, doesn't he look like a, he would be a, a good, good person for an angel to work with. Uh, here's the Great Eastern, and here's the first railway that was, was invented all by Burnell and his lab and his team. And there's the badge from Julian's grandfather, he was the accountant for the operation, and they had to continually raise, raise money. That led the, the basis for any kind of motor-based transportation. So it can happen through a single individual, the power of a single individual. And perhaps <laughs> this guy doesn't wear a top hat, but he has the same kind of taciturn uh, manner to him. Perhaps this is the Isabard Kingdom Brunel of the 21st century, revolutionizing transportation on two levels. SpaceX, and Elon wants to go to Mars. So gradually and slowly, as I do these presentations, I'm meeting people. I met one of his board members in, in June. I met a uh, head of human spaceflight for SpaceX on a cruise ship in Miami uh, about three weeks ago. I'm circling around Elon because I'm ready to do the pitch for this. Give us just a few million a year and we'll, file, we'll fly demonstrator flights of Shepard. Small scale, I mean, you're talking something a few feet across. We'll fly them in low Earth orbit as payloads of opportunity on, on Dra uh, Dragon, on SpaceX flights. Go get a golf ball in the first round. Perfect. Then go get something bigger. Then fly one from the space station and retrieve a bag of trash and bring it back to the station. Go get a dead military satellite, bring it down to low Earth orbit, service it inside the structure with guys in their pajamas and tool belts. You know, we can get a big, big DOD contract that way. And then go for the Trojan objects that are orbiting before and after the Earth in our orbit. Go get a rock, you know. Just keep doing this, just keep building this. So, why are we doing this? Well, this is a, 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 one, of me, one of the good reasons. Stephen Hawking says that our only chance of long-term survival is to not remain inward-looking on planet Earth if we expand and use all its resources, but expand and spread out into space. If we want to continue beyond 100 years, we have to. Our future is in space. We just need that place to expand. We need the resources and we need the perspective on the Earth as well. So you remember this before, my favorite little uh, design for Shepherd, the Shepherd bio. I wanted to say to you, there's something deeper in, in meaning of what we're doing when we do this. Because in, in all of life, the most fundamental act is, is the division of the self 
This is what life is about. Cells divide. Life goes on. My other field is origin of life biochemistry at UC Santa Cruz. So I, I study this a lot. I'm trying to come up with the origin of the genetic code right now. And it struck me that Shepard is like us creating a new kind of cell that can go into the solar system that is actually allowing the Earth to make its double. <laughs> Just carrying on the processes of life, and we may be the tools to do that. Uh, it's a great mission. I mean, maybe human beings need a mission other than, you know, eating more hamburgers and stuff like that. But if we're to allow life to be propagated off the planet, because the planet's got only a few hundred million years of vitality left in it, according to James Lovelock, in terms of the atmosphere and stuff like that. So we, we've got to, this is our prerogative, we've got to allow life to spread into other, not into the cosmos. So that is my message. <laughs> Thank you.